I'm reviewing a book that was released 20 days ago for Indian counselors and psychologists. The preface of this book clearly defines its purpose. Reflective Practice and Professional Development in Psychotherapy by Purnima Bhola, Chetna Rugal and Ratna Isaac. It is the only Indian book that addresses mindful attention or reflection as a medium to scaffold the Indian therapist's learning in their therapeutic work. It's a book for therapists and trainees at all levels of development. I picked up this book because I know the works of two of the three authors, Purnima Bhola and Chetna Dugal, firsthand. I have held them in high esteem from the early days of my career. I have known them to be equanimous and even tempered at all levels of their career. Their writing has always been evidence based and thorough. They are laborious in their documentation and, above all, non partisan. On a side note, the book on eminent Indian psychologists, which was published in 2017, since uh, psychology completed 100 years of its existence in India in 2016, thought it worth dedicating only one chapter, chapter 35, to a woman psychologist, which, as is usual in all sciences, was a grave error of omission, which is why I'm so much more thrilled that all three of the authors were women. I specifically say this because, as it so happens, 90% of my mentors and respected peers in this profession have been brilliant women. I hold the authors of this book in that category, so I came to it with very high expectations. First of all, the book is long. It's meant as a reference book. I enjoyed my initiation into the book. I'm going to be using a few of these cards because I've made notes. Uh, with the example of Horowitz's 2013 book on looking, where she takes us on a series of walks with 11 experts and views the same neighborhood through these different lenses, making the familiar unfamiliar and the old new. So the authors clearly delineate the process of reflection and they highlight cultural context, which is so important. While our profession studies human suffering, suffering our textbooks omit uh, physical and social settings, historically constituted customs and practices, ethno theories, social economics. And this book addresses this gap in India and it recommends reflection and introspection as a means to bridge this gap. The model used uh, is the declarative procedural reflective one where the first system consists of gathering knowledge, the second is practical, where you're actually practicing or you are in supervised therapy. And the last is observing, interpreting and evaluating what happened. Reflection is a luxury in our setting. I mean, if we can charge a client nine to 10,000 rupees for 50 minutes, it can justify the cost of spending another two hours contemplating, investing in oneself and the client and the relationship. Authors clearly talk about what to reflect on, how to do the reflection, including a toolkit for critical thinking, when to reflect and even where to reflect. I was thrilled to see the mention of Carl Jung's Red Book, which is a bit of a giveaway that the authors are well read. The book went on to talk about time travel, where you trace your motivations to become a therapist, in part to rekindle that spark and give meaning again to what you do. They explore autobiographical accounts of therapists that give you an assortment of narratives. They tell you about Marsha Linehan's famous 2011 interview, which Benedict Carey, a science reporter, had written about in the New York Times. Interesting for me how the authors here use the same line of inquiry on origin stories. And you know, this is taken by DC and Marvel universes and we so readily accept that. But uh, we don't really do it with ourselves. And so also I think uh, Dr. Adil Kapoor in his 25 year follow up of why people take sannyas or follow the spiritual path uh, uses the same sort of enquiry. The third chapter addresses the personhood of therapists regardless of their the theoretical orientation. This was an interesting take for me since I'd never really seen myself this way. I did like the inclusion of a therapist's reflections on the self as understood in Indian spiritual thought. Uh, it's also the philosophy that I'm familiar with. I am, however, quite curious to know more about other non-Hindu, non-dominant Indian spiritual traditions, and I await scientific and uh, explorative writings on these as well. So this was the only lacuna that I found. Some of the work proposed by the authors is very helpful in avoiding burnout, which is another reason to read this book. This chapter is a bit technical, but I liked how they speak of an embedded orientation and developing a personal school of therapy 
as uh, a result now these have to fit in with our personality our values our world views our social economics and the question of institutional pluralism is an important one and i would hope that professors of psychology read this chapter with particular interest my entire practice is based on the therapeutic alliance and the authors address this in chapter 5 i enjoyed reading purnima's reflection on her experience of attunement and being married to a musicologist attunement is an important uh, aspect of my life in more than one way i'm of course quite fond of dr somitra bhatari and enjoyed reading his interview um things become slightly more complicated with the pandemic and this chapter might have been modified had the pandemic occurred earlier every chapter has perspectives on training and development which i think is a very valuable addition to this book the next chapter talks about engaging with diversity in the therapy room with dr susan howard previously having talked about warp and weft and so this chapter logically advances that illustration to address multicultural fabric and the existence of cultures within cultures in india i find the addressing of context quintessential to therapy it affects how we see ourselves how our clients see us it filters who can see whom levels of proficiency or cognitive sophistication it determines outcomes in some ways and the example of vikram patel's um, ngo sangat and its model is mentioned apart from some others and of course everyone knows i'm very fond of sangat and the work they do uh, and this has been the case since 2011 there is a very important mention of feelings of inadequacy envy and resentment on the part of the therapist towards the clients from elite or moneyed backgrounds or clients who have something that we don't uh, caste religion gender sexual orientation affirmative practices and other identities are addressed very very important here i'd like to encourage students of psychology to have their professors read this chapter especially if like me you had an enfil chauvinistic professor with conservative beliefs that you knew uh, was dogmatic jingoistic and prejudiced gift them this reading any book that quotes j r r tolkien is unlikely to get any criticism from me so chapter 8 discusses learning from clients and the quote it is time to recast the drama of psychotherapy to retire the star therapist and place the heroic client in the leading role is the hallmark of a good therapist therapy after all is collaborative empiricism client narrators are our teachers feedback is critical and any therapist who persists in disregarding client inputs is incompetent in my opinion clients contribute to one's personal and professional growth chapter 9 addresses supervision and the creation of safe spaces as well as the role of the supervisor as a facilitator of this reflective practice it gives some tips and guidance to supervisors along with a much needed toolkit uh, the 10th chapter addresses therapy for the therapist and for those of us who read freud jung janet brewer spiralrein carl abraham otto rankam the list goes on we're all very well aware of their practices of reflection of therapy of letters and correspondences to each other um culturally i do personally believe we've become much less introspective as healers therapists whatever you want to call us unless you yourself reflect on human suffering on your own suffering something that philosophers have done for centuries be them spiritual religious atheist agnostic thinkers need to spend time in gaining their own insights into their personal suffering and their personal biases i don't think there's any growth without this in chapter 11 the authors discuss investments in the self that's the therapist they call therapeutic work emotional labor i agree with their explanation of the cycle of caring it explains my own burnout they talk of self care in the face of client suicide something that i wish i knew as a young therapist uh, they address the personal lives of therapists especially in india where we have unrelenting standards and self sacrifice as part of our process The last chapter of the book addresses integrating reflection into masters and enfil programs in India. They speak of the emerging evidence base and the need for more research. They speak of the difficulties and challenges in training, the critique of reflective practice alongside the recognition of its potential gives one a sort of balanced view of its value and I appreciate the authors presenting such a balance a balanced appraisal 
rather than you know an unrestrained rhapsodic one-sided praise all in all i was very appreciative of an indian publication without spelling mistakes and i must add that uh, it addresses the range of issues alongside an assortment of case vignettes to better explain how to get on being an indian therapist without working yourself into the ground or uh, burning the candle at both ends i felt quite relieved to see that i was not the only one in that respect this book for me is a win congrats purnima chetna and ratna Thank you.